Okay, it's Wednesday, February 20th, 2013, and we're going to be looking at the natal charts of Russell Nathan Blattberg. So, Russ, uh, your stars. Oh man, I'm going to do this unsystematically. I'm just going to jump around and talk about the things that hit me like a sledgehammer about your chart. My analogy for that is if you see someone walking down the street, some creature, if it's walking upright, has two feet, has two eyes, has a nose, has lips, hair, you know, swinging its arms, you pretty much know you're looking at a human being. You don't necessarily need to go up to that creature with a microscope and analyze them at a molecular level. So that's what I'm going to do here with your chart. Just talk about the main themes that just smack you in the face like a sledgehammer so you can get the overall broad picture because these my theory right now this thing this is just a theory I can't prove any of this scientifically or statistically but uh, these stars reveal some type of mathematics and I think looking at charts is like looking at a fractal I mean you can just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into this so you Russell the first thing about you we talked about this last time um, you Let's see what the traditional astrologers said you were. Yeah, they said you were a Sagittarius. We're not using astrological signs. I'm using the actual constellations. What the signs actually are, like the sign Scorpio has nothing to do with the group of stars called Scorpio. Nothing. Astrological signs are a division of the ecliptic. The apparent path the sun takes around the earth into 12 equal pi slices, 30 degrees. And it's very unfortunate, ecliptical sector one is called Aries. That misleads people into thinking that that ecliptical sector one has something to do with the constellation called Aries. It does not. I'm also of the opinion, when you're using constellations between Scorpio and Sagittarius, there's a constellation called Ophiuchus. And I remember seeing things on YouTube about Nostradamus uh, in, in reference to Ophiuchus. Well, if Nostradamus is, is dealing with Ophiuchus, that tells me he's taking his telescope and he's looking at the actual sky. Simple deduction. Perhaps I'm wrong, but that's my deduction. Okay, so when you look at the sky, I think it makes all the difference. Um, that being said, you, conventional astrology is going to say you're a Sag. In my book, you're not a Sagittarius. You are sun. The sun in the chart represents a person's basic style because our life energy comes from the sun. Your sun is an Ophiuchus, not Sag. You have a lot of Sagittarian energy. You have your Uranus in Sagittarius. You have your Saturn in Sagittarius. And I'm referring to the constellation. You have your Neptune in Sagittarius. So if you were to read some, some interpretation of you being a Sag, some of that's going to ring true. But I don't think it's the whole story because your sun's an Ophiuchus. Now, Ophiuchus... <coughs> I have to send you something about that. I have to email you something about that. Ophiuchus, the mythology of that, it goes back to Egypt. Ophiuchus is a healer. And my interpretation of it is, when you see Ophiuchus on the ecliptic, uh, the horizontal component of it is his feet are on the ecliptic. But short of that, going outside the ecliptic, Ophiuchus towers over the zodiac. It is huge. It's huge. And Ophiuchus is a man and he's holding a snake. He's a snake tamer. So, what my interpretation of that is opposite Ophiuchus and Scorpio, because I, the Scorpio is very small on the ecliptic. It's only seven degrees. So, when I'm speaking of Ophiuchus, I'm also speaking of Scorpio. Since Ophiuchus and Scorpio are opposite Taurus, I say Ophiuchus has to do with wanting to understand the primordial energy's underlying reality. That snake tamer, that Ophiuchian symbolism, I think what the ancients were trying to say is this is shamanistic energy, this is healing energy, this is dealing with the raw primordial energies of nature. You have that. You have your sun in Ophiuchus, you have your moon in Ophiuchus, and since we don't have your birth time, I move the time around from the extremes, from 12 a.m. for December 8th to 11.59 for December 8th. And that moon goes from Scorpio to Ophiuchus. So your moon's definitely in, in Scorpio or Ophiuchus. So you've got a lot of this energy. Scorpio, Ophiuchian energy. Read about the mythology of Ophiuchus. He was a healer. And <clears throat> that's what shamans do because they break down the normal boundaries. They get to the underlying energies under reality. And that's very healing because that's dealing with raw truth. And the truth sometimes hurts. Truth sometimes hurts, but the truth can be very cleansing because it just strips away all the misconceptions and the bullshit. It's like an amputation of an arm that has gangrene. It's not serving the person anymore. 
Apiuchus the Scorpio comes in just hacks it off. <laughs> but the person's better off for it. Extreme example, but that's an energy of how Apiuchian energy can be very healing. Um, so, getting into that though, opposite Apiuchus Scorpio is Taurus. And in my book, my interpretation, Taurus is the fixed tangible reality. That's what you can see, taste, hear, smell, touch. And Apiuchian energy is the energy underneath of that, trying to get deeper than material reality. Now you, jumping all over your chart, you have your Jupiter in Taurus. So that's a nice balance. Jupiter is a benefic planet. Your Jupiter in Taurus, that's, a, that's it's good to have. And your Jupiter is also retrograde. So when I see retrograde planets, and this is based on someone else who I taught my method to, and they said when they see retrograde planets, that means the energy is intensified. So with your Jupiter in Taurus, um, that's a nice balance between the three energies in Apiuchus, Moon, uh, Sun, Mercury, and your Jupiter being in Taurus, which is opposite that. That's a nice balance of being in touch with the material world, but also being in touch with that very spiritual side. Jupiter and Taurus on a mundane level means you're the man to chill out with and have a good time. Because Taurus likes to have a good time. Taurus is about the sensual world. It's about material world. And Taurian people can... You're not a Taurus. You face the world as a Taurus. But Jupiter and Taurus... Jupiter is the lord of luck. Jupiter, Jupiter spreads the feast and says partake. Okay? You have that. You still there, Russ? Yep. Okay, just making sure I didn't lose you because it's awfully quiet. I'm calling through Gmail. Sometimes Gmail loses the connection and I'm talking to somebody. I don't even know the connection got cut. But anyway, so you're Jupiter and Taurus. Also, too, your Taurus, the seventh house, um, the way I do the stars, the seventh house in your chart, that's how you face the world. I use myself as an example. On the inside, I'm a, my son's in Libra, but opposite Libra is Aries, and that's what the world sees. Uh, Libra sometimes, like myself, you can hear it in my voice. I can be very aggressive. I just talk like bam, 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 bam. You know what I mean? That's the Aryan side of me. But me on the inside, I'm a Libra. It's about balance, beauty, and harmony. I don't like to fight with people. I like a spirited debate every now and then, but fundamentally, I don't like making people upset. That's the Libra side of me. I'm just making the point. You, seventh house, you face the world as a Taurian with Jupiter there, and it's retrograde. One thing about Jupiter, on a mundane level, Jupiter and Taurus basically means you're the kind of guy if you want to have a good time and chill out with, Russ is the man. Also, too, though, Jupiter, uh, Jupiter has a lot to do with altruism, optimism, um, philosophy. Jupiter is the intuitive mind. To give a contrast, Jupiter rules Sagittarius. Opposite Sagittarius is Gemini. Gemini would be each little disparate fact, each little discrete fact. Jupiter is the faculty that comes along and connects all those dots and says, this is what it means. Okay, so Jupiter is the intuitive mind. It has to do with truth. It has to do with integrity. You've got that in Taurus in the seventh house. So I could see it just from being friends with you on Facebook. I mean, my God, it's obvious from what you post. That being said, though, even if I didn't know that, I would still feel comfortable saying with Jupiter and Taurus in the seventh house, you face the world as somewhat as a philosopher. You know what I mean? You're about integrity, about being real. That's just Jupiter and Taurus, and that's also the function of Jupiter. And your Jupiter's retrograde. So, Retrograde, my buddy, who uses my method of reading the stars, he's like somewhat of a protege, and he's amazing to me because he's taken it farther than I can, but he said Retrograde Planets means that energy is even more intensified. So, you like to have a good time, but you're also a super philosopher. You know, people might be a little bit misled when they see you. They're going to see that Taurian side of you, 7th house, Jupiter there, but I don't know if they're going to realize that they get on your Facebook page what they're dealing with, because you on the inside, you're an author you can, man. That's deep. Now, let's get into your past lives a little bit. Once again, what the past lives, what I do with these charts. I'm not so good I can specifically perceive the past life where I could say in 1492 you were born in this German principality to Gertrude and Gunther and this happened and that happened but what I can see I can create a fictitious story it's like going to see a movie about World War II a particular soldier might be a fictitious character a particular battle might be a fictitious figment of the imagination I mean the director's imagination but it's set within a historical context World War II and from that fictitious story you get a sense of the dynamics of what war was about and you walk away with the truth. So that's sort of how I do do these uh, stars. When you're looking at the past lives, you look at what's called the dragon's head and the dragon's tail. Dragon's tail is also known as the south node of the moon. Dragon's head is known as the north node of the moon. 
South node of the moon, that's just where the moon crosses the ecliptic heading towards the south pole. North node of the moon, where the moon crosses the ecliptic heading towards the north pole. North node of the moon, I say north node, dragon's head, south node, dragon's tail. Why that's important? Because it's the moon. I found the three things in the chart that are super instinctual. It's like putting food in your mouth. You just taste it. You can't consciously control how your body reacts to it, how you as it taste. The moon itself is very instinctual. Mars is very instinctual. But I, my observation, this is strictly anecdotal. It's not scientific. It's not statistical. But my observation has been that south node is the most instinctual. And that south node represents your past life karma. It's the personality characteristics and traits you develop to a very high level. Okay, the long-winded point I'm making. Your south node is in Leo in the 10th house. Leo is ruled by Pluto. Leo is ruled by the sun. The dignified ruler of Leo is the sun. The exalted ruler, meaning even more powerful, is Pluto. So sometimes you mentioned, some, somebody told you, you were the reincarnation of Jesus Christ, okay? With a south node in Leo, you know, you might have, that might have resonated with you a little bit. Hold on one second, Russ. I'm recording. I'm recording. I'm doing a reading. Okay. So with you, Russ, um, your south node being in Leo, when somebody made that statement to you, that probably really resonated with you because you have that south node in Leo in the 10th house. And the 10th house is the house of eminence and prominence. So when I see a chart with a south node in Leo, this is somebody in their past lives, 10th house, they were known. And you were powerful because you have to also look where the ruler of the south node is. Well, you've got the ruler of your south node in Leo, the sun in Ophiuchus in the first house. That tells me you had some prominence, but Ophiuchus, you were like a king, man, who was just, <laughs> this is the truth, folks. Whether you like it or not, I'm bringing it down on you. I'm going to lay it down on you. And this is the law. Because you also have to look at the exalted ruler of Leo, which is Pluto. You have your Pluto in Libra. And it's not too far away from Venus. And Libra is the law. And you have it in the 12th house. I do things a little differently. I reverse the 6th in the 12th house. I call the 12th house the house of work and service. So you, you were one busy guy, you know. You were kind of like a philosopher king. Look. I've got uh, nobility in my background, and I've looked into the history of that. I've done the genealogy. I've looked in the law, what a lot of these kings were asserting. A lot of kings were illiterate. Charlemagne the Great could not read. I mean, Voltaire always talked about the philosopher king. A lot of kings were just like the godfather, were just enforcers. That's it. But it looks like you with a south node in Leo in the 10th house and then Pluto being in Libra and then the sun, the dignified ruler of Leo, being in Ophiuchus in the first house. Ophiuchus is hardcore. So it means you were probably some type of king or if you weren't the king himself, you were working for the king. You know, you might have you might have been the power behind the throne where the king is just some uh, hereditary monarchy and some idiots just born into that position and you're the real brains behind you. See, when I see the sun in Ophiuchus and your Pluto in Leo with a south, um, your Pluto in Libra with a south node in Leo in the 10th house, it tells me you were more than a king. A lot of, Charlemagne the Great was illiterate. He's the, you know, the emperor of the Frankish Empire. Okay? But he was illiterate. He couldn't read and write. So a lot of kings weren't always the wisest or the smartest of men. They were oftentimes just the most ruthless. And some kings were actually impoverished. They didn't have any money. Hence why the Rothschilds and the bankers were able to influence them. They needed somebody who had some brains to get some money so they could feed their armies and their mercenaries. But anyway, you, with this son in Ophiuchus, it just really looks like you were the power behind the throne. And, uh, you know, you were... I'm going to be intuitive here and go out on a limb and just talk, speak off the cuff, but with the sun and off the Yucas, south node and Leo, it looks like you were tapping into the call. You basically recognized that the king, just the king, a lot of his position was just symbolic. It was just symbolic, and you tapped into the mystery of what a king represents, and you used that symbolism to make sure that king had the influence to implement the policies you wanted. Because, once again, you got to look at where the Pluto is. Pluto's the exalted ruler of Leo, and you have your Pluto in Libra, and Libra's the law in the 12th house. 
So, you know, you were definitely concerned with basically, look, this is the way it really works, Your Majesty, okay? I know you want to bang your mistresses all day and this and that, but this is the way finances work. And, you know, you're going to have to uh, pay some heed to what your senators are saying, too, because some of them are involved with the church, and the church has an occult side to it. So, this is what I see, Russ, pretty deep stuff. Now, what that leads into, though, that south node in Leo, oftentimes i found with these charts, the way I look at my chart, we're carrying around a lot of uh, traumas and things that happened to us in our past lives. And we come into this life and we forget because Capricorn rules death, Cancer rules birth. Well, two of the exalted rulers of Cancer are Neptune and Jupiter, and one of Neptune's functions among as many is to make one forget. Well, that makes sense when you're born, because if you could vividly remember being tortured at the rack, I mean, it might be hard getting your morning cup of coffee and making it through the day if those subconscious memories were boiling up to the conscious mind. Can't prove this scientifically. Scientists might say I'm full of crap, but I think there's something to this. So we've all suffered a lot of traumas, and then what I think happens is we're not consciously aware of them, but those dynamics are still operating below the surface. So we take our current circumstances, and we try to recreate, we try to take the current actors and props in our particular state play this time and recreate the dynamics of those traumas so we can resolve them. Myself as an example, I thought basically for me it was sex, drugs, and rock and roll and music. And then I wondered, okay, Jordan Maxwell's my friend, I'm into this real, real deep, deep stuff. And I look at my chart, there's a lot going on in my chart that goes far beyond just being a musician. And I couldn't understand, why is this musician guy, very simple, play drums, play keyboards, why is, he, why is he intrigued by a guy named Jordan Maxwell? You start looking at the chart, it gets into deep stuff. So with you, with you, Russ, um, making this long-winded point, with a south node in Leo in the 10th house, once again, you know, it looks like you had a lot of influence behind the king, but that was the laws and the decrees of a particular principality. Now you're born with a north node in Aquarius, and Aquarius has to do with cosmic law. I'm not interested in forcing one man's will. I'm not interested in enforcing one cabal's will or their interpretation. Give me something of a higher mentality. Give me some law that applies across galaxies. Give me law that's universal. Give me law that's not about the king's interest. Give me law that's about mankind's interest as a species. That's what Aquarius rules. Universal brotherhood and sisterhood. Uh, Aquarius is di dignified ruler. Is Uranus. Uranus is the higher octave of Mercury. Uranus means a higher mentality. So your north node is in Aquarius. So once again, with this south node in Leo, you know, you got that thing where like you probably have a lot of drive and a lot of will. What I'm saying is the truth because Leo is the heart, so it's your heart. But my observation has been my south node is in Virgo. We all tend to overdo our south node because it's the moon. So it's instinctually what we feel right away. Me with a south node in Virgo, that means overly analytical, analysis paralysis, absolute perfectionism. Going into so much exaggerated detail, I lose the forest for the trees. Okay? So we all tend to overdo our south node. I have to tap into my north node, and it helps being consciously aware of it because I wasn't before. But that south node, if you get too stuck there, you get in trouble. And the antidote to the stress that south node causes is the North Node. Your North Node is in Aquarius. Once again, gets into universal law. Another thing, too, about Aquarius. Aquarius' ruler is, um, is Uranus. Uranus has a lot to do with ETs, extraterrestrials, but Uranus also. Uranus is the sky god. We're moving into an Aquarian age. We've got about, in my opinion, 400 years of Pisces left. We're 99.9% .9 through the age of Pisces. This being said, Uranus being the sky god. Humanity is going into the sky. We are detaching from the Earth. We're going into space. We're starting to explore the solar system. Also, too, Uranus um, also rules astrology. That's the connection between ETs. Uranus and Aquarius have something to do with the stars and um, the stars and astrology, basically. So, you with the North Node in Aquarius, you know, look, the, the, the liability of the South Node in Leo, Leo's fire. So, Leo's the energy that shoots the bow. Aquarius is air. It's an intellectual constellation. It's an air constellation. Leo's a fire constellation. Fire is what draws the bow and shoots it. The air constellation is the intellect that guides the bow and aims for the target. So you, you have a north node in Aquarius. Sometimes people with a south node in Leo, it can be too much of my will be done. I'm here on a divine mission. And it has to be my way because I feel it in the depths of my soul and the depths of my heart. 
Well, your north node in Aquarius to say, whoa, 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 hold on. That's good. You can tap into that. South node's not poison. But don't be afraid to look at things more objectively. Okay? There's other people involved and possibly other species. You know, the law is more than just the law you feel in your heart. Okay. Um, any questions, Russ? Any comments? Your questions and comments help focus this because, believe me, we're not going to finish reading your chart. I've been looking at Jordan Maxwell's chart for 10 years, and as I say, it's like a mathematical fractal. Every time I look at it, I just go deeper and deeper and deeper. So I'm going to keep this just moving around really quick. But sometimes this might raise some questions with you, and your comments and questions help focus things. Cause I'm, for 20 minutes, man, I just spat out a lot of stuff. You know? Still there, Russ? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Um, no, no. Okay, I um, just, I just keep talking. Yep. Okay, let me uh, let me see what else jumps out at me. Like I said, I'm going to talk about the things that hit me like a sledgehammer. Because if I start getting into super super specific stuff, I could talk for two hours just about your south node and Leo and how that relates to uh, Aphiuchus and all this stuff. All right. So right now, what I'm doing, I'm talking. I'm just looking at the chart I drew up by hand. That's the basic sky map. And uh, then after that, I'm going to start looking at those color charts, which gets into how those planets start speaking together. And that's where you start getting more of the detail. Now, another thing about you, Russ, you have three energies in Sagittarius. That's called a stellium, when you have three or more energies in a particular place. So you have that in Sagittarius. You have one of the dignified co-rulers, Neptune, in Sagittarius in the second house. The second house, they say, is the house of money. But taking it on a more abstract, broader level, you spend your money on what you value. So you, with a stallion of Sagittarius, Sagittarius is also a fire energy. Sagittarius likes to see the big picture. Um, so what this means is you, with three energies in Sagittarius in the second house, you're a truth seeker. Big time truth seeker. Uh, you have Saturn and Sagittarius in the second house. Truth is very important to you, but you might really be seeking this very with a lot of effort because wherever Saturn's at that that part of the chart Saturn says you're not done here Saturn's known as the great karmic teacher another one of Saturn's functions too it, just, it focuses energy so wherever you see Saturn in the chart it's an area you're not done and you're focused on so Saturn in Sagittarius Neptune in Sagittarius Uranus in Sagittarius it's like important to you. What is the big picture here? What you put Neptune there? What is the spiritual meaning of this picture? You put Uranus there. Okay, what's the ET connection? What's the higher mentality? What is this truth? This truth cannot just be this third-rate version of reality I've been said. I know there's more to it, and that Saturn's going to keep hounding you. Keep looking for the big picture. Big, big picture. Sag Sagittarius is ruled by Jupiter. Its dignified co-ruler is Neptune. So as I said, Jupiter synthesizes things. It's intuitive knowing. Just at a high, just know. I can't tell you why I know. I just know. It goes beyond words. Dignified ruler of Sagittarius, Neptune. Neptune's a little bit like that. Neptune dissolves boundaries. So with Neptune and Sagittarius, you're, just, you're seeking. What is this oneness? What is this connection with everything? This is deep, man. You're a deep, deep truth seeker. You're looking for the big spiritual connection. You're looking for the higher mentality, you know? So I see that on your Facebook page, but I will be saying the exact same thing whether you sent me that or not. I would be saying the same thing. Just now I get to see a little more clearly. Look, I can't see everything looking at this two-dimensional representation of your life. This is like a map. You know this stuff, the specific facts of what I'm saying. I just see the basic temperament of you and the big overall picture. Okay. Um, this being said, though, this Aquarius, you have a north node in Aquarius in the fourth house. Aquarius, two dignified rulers are Uranus and Saturn. And you have Uranus and Saturn right in Sagittarius. And you have Neptune there. So with a north node in Aquarius, and the exalted ruler of Aquarius is Mercury. Your Mercury's in Ophiuchus. The two dignified co-rulers of Aquarius, uh, Uranus and Saturn, are in your second house in Sagittarius. Man, you just... You're meant to seek the higher mentality, the higher vibration, just deep, deep, deep spiritual truth, the deeper, the darker. Because Aphiuchus, once again, is getting your Mercury's in Aphiuchus. That's the dignified, that's the exalted ruler of your North Node in Aquarius. So you, man, you're meant to really go deep, deep, deep. I mean deep. Far beyond anything I could do. This is your gift. 
You're meant to go deep. What is this reality? What is this experience I'm having? What is the spiritual dimensions of this? What is the intellectual dimensions? What, what's the ET connection? It's deep. I might not even be expressing it adequately. You probably can articulate it a lot better than me. Now, another thing too. You have a south node in Leo in that 10th house. One of the liabilities of that could be um, you trying to put yourself out there because 10th house is the house of prominence. So I'll use Jordan Maxwell as a convenient example. Jordan, unlike you, he has his dragon's head north node and the dragon's head north node is the destiny of the chart. He has that in his 10th house. Jordan Maxwell became world famous without even trying. My opinion, that's because his north node is in the 10th house. 10th house is the house of eminence and public standing. You have your south node in the 10th house. South node means been there, done that. So, that being said, one of the dangers, liability of a south node in Leo in the 10th house could be trying to put yourself out there. I am the great almighty Russ and I have the truth, all the spiritual answers. That could be, a, you, can, you can tap into that, but you have to realize your north node, the destiny, which will harass the shit out of you if you don't tap into it. Your north node is in the fourth house in Aquarius. This is almost like a personal journey. You can share it with the world, but ultimately it's not about making yourself famous as like the, the world famous philosopher. That can be there. The spiritual seeker. That can be there a little bit, but you've got to realize your north node's in the fourth house. Now, fourth house is home, tribe, clan, families, people in your family. It can actually be the home setting. So, a lot of this is meant to be a personal journey because you, you already, you work behind the kings and stuff like that. This is why you know so much. For being so young, you know a lot. It's obvious from being on your Facebook page. It's obvious from speaking to you. You're carrying around a lot, you know. And with the South Node and Leo in the 10th house, it's like carrying the weight of the world on your shoulder. Because anybody you get behind, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna be the, always be the power behind the throne. But your North Node's in Aquarius. It's saying, find your own home. Now another thing too, with a North Node Aquarius in the fourth, fourth house, your home might be the universe your connection to the universe and with a north node in Aquarius and a south node in Leo in the 10th you might be saying you know what I don't think this primitive this primitive little rock three three positions from the sun earth is necessarily my ultimate home my home's really amongst the stars see this is what your north node in Aquarius might mean so some of this I'm channeling, Russ. Some of this is not even conscious, but you with a North Node and Aquarius in the Force and <laughs> where you're... Holy shit, now I'm saying it. You're like on a cosmic quest of who am I really? Not just flesh and blood. Who am I really? And how the fuck do I get back home? And your home's like in the cosmos. Ah, this is deep stuff. Deep, deep stuff. Forgive me if I sound like I'm a little overwhelmed, but this is deep stuff deep stuff when somebody else's energy starts coming through me it's just deep it's powerful anyway um, so that's it Russ that's what you're on man that's Joey D's interpretation you're on this quest to find what's my real home there's got to be more than just earthly success and all the bullshit that goes on this planet you take me to a more enlightened civilization bring me back home people who am I connected to the Pleiadians the Anunnaki I don't know these alien species as well as you do but you're trying to get back home Another thing about Sagittarius, Sagittarius, that constellation, it's an archer with an arrow, and that arrow is pointing to the galactic center. So Sagittarius has this cosmic side to it, very cosmic, very um, universal. It has a lot to do with the stars, and just it's deep, it's deep. Paula Violet talks about a lot of this stuff, what this zodiac really means, and its connection to ETs and ancient civilizations. And, it's deep. So this is what you're about, right? This is really like a quest. It's like, what is my home in the universe? How am I going to get back to who I really belong to? Because I don't necessarily belong here. It's a little too primitive for me. Whew. All right. Look, reinforcing that point, um, you have your Mars in the fifth house in Pisces. The energy of Mars. Mars is the energy of assertion. Mars is what makes a lion go out and hunt down a gazelle. So your Mars is in Pisces in the fifth house. With your Mars being in Pisces, you assert yourself in a Piscean way. And Pisces is about compassion. Pisces is about ultimate love. Pisces is about music. And just 
divine art. There's things that dissolve normal boundaries of perception. That's what spirituality is about. Religion is Virgo. In my opinion, religion causes division. Spirituality is about dissolving boundaries. Spirituality is about uniting. So, because it's the function of Neptune to dissolve. Virgo is like the energy of like a lawyer with my dragon tail, very analytical, this, that, that all the I's got to be dotted, T's have to be crossed. That's religion. Another thing about Virgo, Virgo can be very sadomasochistic. If you don't follow what's written in the book exactly or do, do what the creed says perfectly, you'll whip yourself with a leather whip with spikes on the end of it. Pisces is spirituality. That's about love, dissolving boundaries, just opening up to the oneness of everything. That being said, said though this is a very powerful part of who you are because you have your Mars and Pisces and it's in the fifth house fifth house on a lower level is the house of love and romance that's the house that makes babies on it so it's procreative energy but on a higher level it's creative energy it's one's entrepreneurial endeavors one's projects so to speak so you with your Mars and Pisces you've got a very strong artistic side to yourself too you express yourself you just go about initiating the way you want to do things in a Piscean manner hey I mean sometimes with Mars and Pisces sometimes people like you are sometimes hard to figure out because your motives are a little different you know Mars is a very martial Aryan type of energy but put that martial Aryan energy that energetic energy in Pisces Pisces is about helping the poor it's about being compassionate you know, that's what separates us from the animals so much I mean Pisces is a water sign and there's one interpretation of Pisces that says it's a societal survival dynamic Water means survival. Cancer means survival of the individual. Scorpio rules the genitals. Atheucus and Scorpio rules the genitals. That's water. That means survival of the family because the genitals reproduce the family. Pisces is a societal survival dynamic. That's what makes people compassionate. We don't kill the weak. We don't kill the infirm. We try to save them. So, and your Mars is there. So that would make you a very compassionate person. All right, let me look at uh, how these planets are speaking to each other to get into a little more detail in your chart. Um, let me just run down real quick and see where things go with this. All right. <clears throat> When we look at you, you have four charts total. Most people, when they're doing a chart reading, they're only giving you 25% of the information. That's the conventional trines, oppositions. That's all well and good. That's 25% of it. The planets speak horizontally on the ecliptic to each other. Trines, opposition, conjunction, squares. But there's a vertical component of that in the Earth chart called declinations. Because those planets speak vertically, you have to look at how those planets above the ecliptic, I mean, above the, above the ecliptic speak to each other. So when we do that in your Earth chart, what I see, I see your Sun talking to Saturn. You have your Sun and Ophiuchus speaking to Saturn and Sagittarius. So Sun and Saturn. Sun is, our life energy comes from the Sun. So the Sun represents one's basic lifestyle. Yours is talking to Saturn. So you like things structured. You like a structured approach to things. But that son of yours is also talking to your Uranus, and, uh, your Uranus and Sagittarius. So your son talking to Uranus, remember Uranus is the higher octave of Mercury. Mercury is intellectuality. Right now, I'm communicating to you in a material fashion. I'm passing air over vocal cords, moistened by mucus. Relative to Uranus, that's a very primitive way of communicating. Uranus would be com communicating through telepathy or using your mind to connect to an alien spe species in another galaxy or using your mind to manipulate material matter. That's Uranus. It's the higher octave of Mercury. So you, with your son talking to Mercury, your son talking to Uranus, the higher octave of Mercury, basically it means you're a complete mental maverick. You're not afraid to deviate left to center and embrace <laughs> just realities that are far, far outside the mainstream. You know, you're a rebel. Your son talking to Uranus too, you do not want anyone. Uranus is like the genius. It's like, do not confine me with your old ossified traditional ways of looking at things. I want to challenge that. I want to challenge tradition. You can function in the establishment. Your son talks to Saturn. Saturn would be consensus reality. we got to stop at stoplights because Saturn has, is exalted in Libra. Saturn has a lot to do with the establishment and law. Uh, has a lot to do with relationships, respecting everyone. 
you can do that. Your sun talks to Saturn. But then again, your sun talks to Uranus. So you can also say, you know, the way you do things, some of these laws and some of these establishments and some of these uh, traditions you have are really, when you think about it deeply, pretty fucking stupid. So I'm not going to go there. I'm going to elevate my mind a little bit and just not even deal with that. That being said, though, your sun also talks to Neptune. Neptune's a little more distant from the sun than Saturn and Uranus. Neptune's getting even deeper. Neptune's now getting into, I'm just going to dissolve all boundaries now and just deal with the oneness of everything, the spiritual connection underlying everything. Everything. So you've got your sun talking to Saturn, sun talking to Uranus, sun talking to Neptune. You are like this man who can function in the establishment, not be so outside the box, no one can understand you. But then your sun's talking to Uranus, complete mental maverick. Then your sun talks to Neptune. To make it even more, let me see, to make it even more intense though, the sun talking to Uranus and Neptune, Saturn also talks to Uranus and Neptune. So you've got like this Sun, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, deep, deep connection. This is this is pretty intense. This is pretty intense. So you're dealing with spiritual realities. You're dealing with mental realities. You're trying to function in the establishment. You're trying to bring like a new order, a new mentality. Because Saturn likes to build. And your Saturn's very strong. So you're trying to bring like a spiritual... <laughs> Saturn talking to Uranus, Saturn talking to Neptune, Uranus is higher mentality, it's talking to Saturn, Saturn's a builder, Saturn's the energy behind the pyramid, so you're trying to build a more, a deeper uh, intellectual awareness of things, but then your Saturn's talking to Neptune, so now you're trying to also bring in, don't just be Mr. Spock, look at the spiritual side of this too, and you're trying to build it, you're trying to build it, but your son is an Ophiuchus, and Afiyukis has a way of coming right in there and just blowing people's minds. Because as I said, Afiyukis strips right down. I don't want to hear your misconceptions. I don't want to hear your bullshit. There's a reality you're not aware of. I'm going to give it to you hardcore. I'm going to tell you about laws and things you don't even understand on a cosmic level and show you a deeper reality. I know it sounds crazy, Russ, but this is what your stars tell me. So, you know, I see it on your Facebook page. I'd say the same thing without even saying this. And another thing, too, that makes this extremely strong. When you look at this color chart I sent you, you'll see a circle. That circle represents the horizontal component of your chart. In that circle, you'll see a hexagram. That's the vertical side of your chart. When you see planets at the bottom or the top of that hexagram, that means they're in extreme latitude. Just being at an extreme latitude like that gives them a lot of power. You you have this Sun, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune all working together at an extreme latitude. Your moon's also at an extreme latitude, as is your Mercury. So, the thing is, man, just basically, you're out there. You're supposed to be out there. Okay? So, I'm just telling you, this is the way your chart is. You're like, this chart represents the frozen piece of the universe that you are. You're out there, bro, and you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be out there. I'm saying, embrace it. I'm sure you already have, but I'm just hoping this reading lets you know there's nothing you're going to do to change this. You're not going to fit inside the mainstream box. It's just not happening. That's my opinion. That's my opinion. Let me look around at some other stuff here. Now, as I said, if you have any questions, just pop in. No problem. Um... Oh, let's see. Okay, well, once again, you know, you have Mars and Pisces. You have Mars making a square to your Neptune and Sagittarius. Neptune rules Pisces and Sagittarius. Neptune is the dignified ruler of Pisces. Neptune is the dignified co-ruler of Sagittarius. Once again, Russ, what this means is you are, you've got one foot in this reality a little bit because your son talks to Saturn. Your Saturn, you, you have a Saturn Uranus eclipse too. Your Saturn is making a conjunction to Uranus on the horizontal side of the chart, and Saturn's making a vertical component. Anyway, Mars talking to Neptune. The whole thing's about spiritual reality. That's what it's about. Mars and Pisces talking to the ruler of Pisces, Neptune, which is in Sagittarius. Neptune being the dignified ruler of Sagittarius. You've just got a very elevated way of looking at these things. You know, you, you just, you're trying to bring in a cosmic reality. You're saying, look, your little place in this little pond, this little puddle you call Earth, is just such a limited view of what is really out there, who you really are. You feel this because you're Jupiter's in Taurus and Mars is talking to Neptune. 
You feel this in the pit of your soul. You feel it deeply. This is just a small little portion of what reality is. And here, folks, I'm like David Bowie, Ziggy Stardust. There's a star man. He'd like to come and meet us, but he thinks he'd blow our mind. That's your song, man. Did you see? <laughs> ah, shit. Hold on, I gotta catch my breath here. All right, let's see how these planets are talking. Another thing, too, about you, Rush, you have that Jupiter and Taurus. That Jupiter of yours is making a 150-degree angle to your Uranus and Sagittarius. Once again, you can party with Russ. Uh, Jupiter and Taurus, Russ is going to be very charming. Russ is going to make you feel good. But Russ is Jupiter's talking to Uranus and Sagittarius. Russ, very soon, within the span of about seven minutes, the party is going to get really strange because he's going to tell you some shit that's going to blow your mind. You ain't even going to need to smoke any doobie or anything like that. Russ is just going to talk to you. Your fucking mind's going to be blown. That's it. You're just you're going to enter a new reality. If you can't handle it, get the fuck out of here. I think this is what you were telling me the other day about some guy you met. This being said, though, I see this because I see your Jupiter retrograde talking to your Uranus uh, and, and Sagittarius. Jupiter is the ruler of Sagittarius. It's the dignified ruler of Sagittarius. So, you know, you're trying to... Earth, Taurus is Earth energy and your Jupiter there. Jupiter is talking to your Uranus and Sagittarius. You're trying to bring this cosmic stuff to the Earth. Like, people, let's bring it down. Let's fix reality. Let's fix the problems on this planet. You're trying to make it concrete. I don't know if you're going to succeed. It's a pretty tall order. You ain't all from here, and you're channeling some cosmic shit, but give it a shot. Now, also, too, your Jupiter making a 150-degree angle to your Uranus. Jupiter talking to Uranus. Jupiter's the lord of luck and expansion. Uranus is universality. This means you have the potential for being spreading your word, your philosophy, far and wide. Sometimes Jupiter talking to Uranus, because Uranus means universal, and it's fast. So the Internet's ruled by Uranus. That, Uranus spreads things, spread things around the Internet fast. Jupiter is expansion. So people who have Jupiter talking to Uranus, they have the, they have the potential to be big universal. Big universal is a synonym, a synonym phrase for saying famous. You could be somewhat famous if you want to. The thing you've got to be careful is you have a south node in Leo in the 10th house, so you don't necessarily want to do it to get unwanted attention. You're really ultimately looking for your cosmic home. You've, you've dealt with kings and such on this earth ruling them. You're looking for your real home. North Node and Aquarius in the fourth. And that being said, you're trying to bring a, build a little bit of energy here because your North Node's in Aquarius and you have Saturn and Uranus and Sagittarius in your second house, the house of values. I'm telling you, man, you're home. That's what you're really doing on this earth. It's not about making money. It's not. That might be part of it on a mundane level. Jupiter and Taurus, you probably enjoy the finer things in life. But really, man, Joey D's interpretation, talk to another psychic, talk to another astrologer, get a second, third opinion. But I'm telling you, what I see is ultimately motivating you. You're looking, my home is not here. My home somewhere in the stars. It's somewhere out there. I'm trying to find it. Alright, keep stuff left. Let me go to your sun chart. Well, let me look at how these planets are speaking in your um, earth chart. Let's see. Yeah, okay. I pretty much touched on it. Yeah, you've got Saturn talking. Let me see where your Chiron's at. Okay. Yeah, your Chiron, which is a planetoid between Saturn and Uranus, this planetoid called Chiron, it was discovered, I think, around 1977, has a lot to do with this new coming age. Your Chiron's in the Club of Orion. It's in a constellation called Orion. But for you, it's the part of Orion that's over, that's under Gemini a little bit in your 8th house. And that Chiron of yours is making an opposition to your Saturn. So your Saturn's in Sagittarius, your Chiron, 8th house. You know, Gemini, Sagittarius is the big overall cosmic picture. This is the meaning. Um, Gemini is the little disparate facts. This fact, this fact, this fact, this fact. You've got your Chiron in Gemini. So once again... Saturn, uh, your Chiron's opposing Saturn and Sagittarius, you're trying to bring in a lot of information. And that Chiron of yours in Orion, under the part of Gemini that's in the 8th house, 8th house is the house of death. But when I say death, I don't necessarily mean physical death. I mean death uh, in the sense when you transcend limits 
that's a form of death. If, uh, if a relationship ends, that's a form of death. If you have a philosophical epiphany, that's a form of death. You never see things the same way again. You've got Saturn and Sagittarius making an opposition to that Chiron and Gemini in the eighth house. Gemini is an air constellation. So it's trying to bring in a lot of intellectuality. It's, it's the teacher. So... You, you're you're um you're a little bit you can be a little bit uh you probably are not you won't shy away from a debate because you've got this Chiron in the Club of Orion it's in Gemini in the eighth house and Saturn talking to this you know and sometimes you might, I don't know how hesitant you are sometimes Saturn brings in a lot of reserve being careful about what you're going to say but when you do start talking about what you're talking about Chiron people are going to start to listen to you a little bit because Chiron these people called the Magi astrologers and I cherry pick from different schools they say Chiron has a lot to do with someone just being somewhat trustworthy a little bit noteworthy now you since Saturn's talking to Chiron Saturn you might have a little bit of obstacles of people you know they're not necessarily going to in first impression believe what you're saying because what you're saying is so out there it's so deep and it's, just, it's like a, for them it's going to be a philosophical epiphany that I had no idea this is how uh, how reality functions you, with these three energies in Sagittarius, you just intuitively know this is how the world really works and it ain't anything they showed you on the TV and it's not anything you learn in school. No, 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 no. And sometimes you try to communicate that, but with Chiron talking to Saturn, it's not always easy. You probably get some opposition, but you're bringing in a lot of information. Um, let me see what else is going on here. All right, let's look at your sun chart. Well, hold on a second. Your Neptune, your Neptune talks to. Okay, your Neptune is making an angle to your North Node. So this this Aquarian search for the cosmic home. You're just you're looking for your cosmic brothers, and you're looking for the cosmic spiritual connection. That's what Joey D sees. Okay, and this is very active too. This is a very active search because your Mars and Pisces in the fifth house. This is like your real project. This is your real mission. Beyond all the other things you might do on a mundane level, that Mars and Pisces in the fifth house. And fifth house, I said, is creative energy. It's like your entrepreneurial endeavors. That Mars is talking to your North Node in Aquarius. And Mars is energy. So when Mars touches, touches something, it energizes it. So you're actively seeking, man. Your real home is not here. It's not this body. It's not this earth. It's deeper than that. It's bigger than that. It's cosmic. Let's go to your sun chart. Talk about this. All right. Your sun chart. You have to talk about the sun chart. There's a vertical and horizontal component to this, too. I think it's important to look at the heliocentric slash sun chart because our life energy comes from the sun. I haven't figured it all out yet what the sun chart means, but it's still very important. And one thing that's very prominent in your sun chart, you have Mercury conjunct Uranus in the sun chart. Uranus is the higher octave of Mercury. So you're very open to intellectual ideas, challenging ideas. Also, too, it makes you smart as hell. When Mercury talks to Uranus, Uranus can be very fast. Mercury itself is fast. The symbolism is the winged messenger. Mercury's the one delivering the information. Now combine it with Uranus, the sky god. Uranus rules lightning strikes, sudden release of energy, rules uranium. Mercury conjunct Uranus in the sun chart. That's a brain that's always it's all over the place. It's all over the place. It's good, but it's just quick, fast. Okay? You're looking at things on a deep level. But also, too, this Mercury of yours talks to your Jupiter. It makes a 150-degree angle. Mercury works very well with Jupiter. A particular school of astrologers called the Magi astrologers say Mercury talking to, the, talking to Jupiter is borderline genius. So you take Mercury conjunct Uranus with Mercury talking to Jupiter, and your Jupiter and Uranus are speaking together. Okay, so you've got a very tight synchronization here with Mercury, Mercury's mental mental facility. So your mind's very agile. Yeah, you've got Jupiter talking to a Mercury-Uranus eclipse, and Jupiter's making a 150 degree angle to Uranus. Uranus is eclipse uh, is conjuncting Mercury, and then Mercury's talking right back to that Jupiter. Okay. So, as we said in the Earth chart, Jupiter talking to Uranus, that if you so choose, that's the potential to spread the word far and wide about what you feel and what you're working on. Um, you just got that potential to get a little well-known for this. And you do want to communicate it, but it's out there. Also, too, that Jupiter is making a 150-degree angle to Saturn in the Sun chart. When I see people with Jupiter talking to Saturn, and you have an enhancement aspect, conjunctions, trines, and 150 degree angles, quincunxes is a 150 degree angle, they are enhancements, means they're harmonious, they're powerful. 
your Jupiter's talking to Saturn. So when I see people with Jupiter talking to Saturn, Saturn is structure. Saturn sometimes can feel like the obstacle in life, but it's the obstacle, once you conquer it, it's the ultimate triumph because Saturn made you climb Mount Everest. You got through the death zone, you planted your flag on top, there's no stopping you now. Uh, so Saturn can be big obstacles, but then you combine it with Jupiter. Jupiter is the lord of luck and expansion. Jupiter talking to Saturn. When I see this in people's chart, that tells me these people on a soul level picked a big mission. So there's no need to be in any hurry, in my opinion. Get a second, third opinion, maybe another psychic, maybe another astrologer, but my opinion. Jupiter talking to Saturn. You pick something big. This Jordan Maxwell has Jupiter conjunct Saturn. He's 72 and he's just coming into his own. Not saying it's going to take you that long, but what you're doing, this is lifelong. You picked a big mission, so to speak. And you're going to get the word out there. Also, too, what makes this even more complex, as I said about Chiron, Chiron has to do with people listening to what you say, being noteworthy, being charismatic, being trustworthy. Jordan Maxwell has his Mercury talking to Chiron. Jordan Mercury rules the voice, how one speaks. Jordan Maxwell could be talking about clubbing baby seals to death and people would like it because his Mercury talks to Chiron. You, you have this uh, Mercury conjunct Uranus talking to your Jupiter, Jupiter talking to Saturn, your Mercury-Uranus conjunction and Saturn are all talking to that Chiron in the Sun chart, and Jupiter's talking to that Chiron. So this is a very tight synchronization of Jupiter, Chiron, Mercury, Uranus, and Saturn. Once again, you know, you're kind of like, <laughs> I'm here to deliver a message, folks, from a galaxy a long, long, far, far away from a long time ago. You've got this. You've got this, man. You're dealing with this. It's even reflected in your sun chart. So keep spreading the word far and wide. Not everybody's going to be able to keep up with your message because it's so deep. It's so profound. Don't worry about that, you know, because you're functioning from somewhat of a higher mentality. That thing is superior. Well, I don't know. Maybe you are superior to some people mentally and things like that. You know, you got a, <laughs> you got a deep vision, man. you got a very deep vision, and, and you feel this stuff because your Jupiter's so prominent. Once again, Jupiter's intuitive knowing. All right, let me look at some other angles here. Whew, man. About the channel. <clears throat> Let's see. Okay, when we look at... Yeah, say you've got Jupiter... You've got Jupiter making a 150-degree angle to Saturn on the horizontal side of the sun chart, but on the vertical side, you have Jupiter contra-parallel Saturn, and Jupiter's contra-parallel Neptune, and Saturn's parallel Neptune. So Saturn, Neptune, and Jupiter are all working together. When Jupiter's talking to Neptune, that is a sense of the vastness and profound grandeur and vision of what life encompasses. That's what I get when I see people talking with Jupiter talking to Neptune. They just have that almost surrealistic, vivid, like life's a dream, the dream is life. It's just the immensity and grandeur and mystical, um, I can't even think of the words, mystical re revelation of what this life really is. See, and it's talking to you. These are all working together. These are all working together. So once again, man, Saturn is the builder. So you're here to build. I'm going to build a vision on this earth. I'm going to take it to people. I'm going to build something. I'm going to show them. This is the reality. This is the higher vibration. When you look at the earth chart, I mean the sun chart, in the earth chart, the sun represents the person. In the sun chart, the earth represents the person and also the relationship that person has with everyone else on the earth. You in your sun chart, you have your Uranus contra parallel earth. Uranus is the higher mentality. Yours is the intellectual maverick. Yours is the person challenging the um, just the old traditional consensus reality. You're a maverick, man. A good maverick. But also, too, Uranus, ETs, astrology. I mean, you're meant to bring in all this <laughs> off-the-wall information. Your Uranus talks to the Earth. Your Mercury conjuncts Uranus. So, this is what you're about. When you look at uh, the vertical side of your sun chart, Mars parallels that Uranus. So, once again, too, with your Mars talking to Uranus, Mars is pretty quick. Mars is like the boxer. Mars is what makes people race. Mars is what makes people athletic. You take Mars talking to Uranus, Uranus being the sudden release of energy, your Mars talking to Uranus can also give you a real impulsive streak, too. Your Mars also talks to the Earth. So you've got Uranus talking to the Earth, Mars talking to the Earth, Mars talking to Uranus. Your Mars talking to the Earth. Once again, you're a little bit of a fighter too. 
You know, if somebody's really going to challenge what you believe, because what you believe is somewhat out there from a normal perspective. From my perspective of what the stars are telling me, what you're saying is not so much out there. But for somebody who's just strictly in the mainstream, their whole conception of reality is what's on TV, you're going to blow their freaking mind. I mean, it might put them a little bit on a defensive sometime, because you're just coming from somewhere that's way out there. But your Mars makes a contra parallel to the Earth. So, you're going to be somewhat aggressive about this. If someone's saying, hey man, Russ is just some crazy dude, you're going to, you're going to basically give them a run for their money, like, well, I know this, I know this, did you know this, you, you want to challenge me intellectually? It ain't happening. Okay? You've got some of that fighter in you. You're Mars talking to the Earth. So, um, another thing too about you, Russ, when you look at your sun chart, your Venus squares Neptune. Neptune's the higher octave of Venus. Venus has to do with how one talks to people, I mean, how one relates to people, to yourself, to everything. When I see people with Venus talking to Neptune, I know these are people who are sensitive. Sensitive to art, sensitive to beauty, sensitive to love. You've got a very sensitive side. You're, you're way more sensitive than the average bear. Okay? You get a lot of sensitivity. That's a gift. Sometimes the world, uh, people would just, sometimes people think sensitivity is not an asset. I think it's an asset. Venus talking to Neptune, you're wide open, man. You're wide open. You pick it all up. You feel it all. You know? But you know what to do with it. Um, let's see here. Okay. Russ, let me see how much I talk here. I think this is my overall view. I talk for 55 minutes. This is my overall understanding of what the major themes are in your chart. Was that helpful? Yeah, man, definitely. Okay. I'm going to mail, email this out to you, get this audio reading out to you. I sent you the charts. You listen to that. If you want to ask me questions, we're on Facebook. I don't charge for that shit. You're going to keep me for 20 hours, throw me a $5 tip. But if you got questions, feel free to ask because believe me. This is just the tip of the iceberg, okay? These charts to me are like mathematical fractals. I've been looking at Jordan Maxwell's chart for 10 years. Every time I look at it, I see something new. Um, let, me, let me talk a little bit about your transits for the moment, though. You tell me if this is what's going on in your life. What I found with the stars, when you look at the Earth chart, um, you have a natal north node and a natal south node. You have a natal dragon's head and a natal dragon's tail. These planets in your, that you were born with, that's the frozen piece of the universe that's just your temperament that you're always carrying around with you when you chose to incarnate because the planets reflected the energy that you need to do accomplish your mission, so to speak. That being said, obviously the planets keep moving. When they keep moving, they interact with the planets in your natal chart. But what I've found, it's really the north node that shows what the major theme is, what's really going on right now. So for you, right now, the North Node is transiting through Libra. That started roughly August 2012, and the North Node will be in Libra till November 2013, at which point in time the North Node will transit into Virgo, which for you is your 11th house. So what that means is with your North Node hitting your uh, Libra right now, you have your natal Pluto in Libra. You have Venus in Libra transiting Saturn's going through Libra. Twelfth house, you've got the natal north node going through your twelfth house in Libra. I call houses 7 through 12 the public side of your life. Uh, that's because 12th house is the house of work and service. You're inv involved with the public, you know, your job and things like that. The 11th house is known as peers of the realm. These are, they call it the house of friends and wishes, but they're not really the friends that you're chummy chummy with and go to a sports bar and catch a buzz with. These are friends who are established, who have stature. You scratch their back, they scratch yours, and you can do each other professional favors. Call it the house of networking. I call it the peers of the realm. If you're friends with a senator, he's obviously going to be gave you, give you a pull and fulfill some of your wishes. He can put you in powerful places. So that's the 11th house. 10th house is the house of career and public standing. 8th house, I mean ninth house is the house of publishing. The point being, all these houses, 7 through 12, that is what I call the public side of your life. Houses 1 through 6 I call the private side of your life. House number 1 is just you. I just exist. It's like your body. I'm just here. I exist. This existence of this incarnation of Russell Nathan Blackberg, that's my stage I perform upon. Second house, house of resources, how you get the resources and money you need to sustain this existence. Third house, 
Um, that's how you think. That's how you speak. You in the third house, you're a Capricorn. Fourth house, home and hearth, so to speak. Fifth house, um, children, creative projects. Sixth house, house of retreat. Point being, houses one through six are the private side of your life. Why I said all that? You're transiting north nodes in Libra in your twelfth house. It's time for you to go public. That's what, when I see stuff going through houses 12 through 7, that's like that 12 to 14 year period. I sometimes see it with artists. I sometimes see it with actors. I sometimes see it with bands. They're on this like 10 year streak where they're basically at the top. Everything they touch turns to gold. Then they become obscure for 10 years, 15 years. Then they make a comeback and everybody loves them again. I, my interpretation can't prove it statistically or scientifically, but I think that has something to do with the North Node. It goes through houses 12 through 7. The public embraces you. North Node then goes through houses 6 through 1. Now you're back on the private side of your life. You're working on personal development again before you hit the, hit the public stage again. Blah, blah, blah. Just being said, you've got the North Node going through Libra now, the 12th house, which is the house of work and service. You're going public again with what you know. The dragon's head and, head and tail just went through Ophiuchus Tars. You just had the dragon's... Uh, prior to August 2012, the dragon's head was going through Ophiuchus in your first house. That was a complete regeneration of who you are. This is who I... Atayukas is about stripping things down and rebuilding it stronger. Just strip away all the bullshit, all the misconceptions, things that didn't work, and just take the essence that's left, that's the good stuff, and work with that, you know? So you were redefining yourself. Now that that was when the North Node was in Atayukas Scorpio, and you were thinking, okay, what am I going to do with my life? What's going to be my work and service? Now that North Node is in Libra in your 12th house of transiting Saturn there. So you're... I don't know, man. You're going out there. You're looking like, okay, I got a new mission now. You know, what am I going to do day to day to generate some bucks and spread the word about universal law and love and all this stuff? It's all about Libra now. And, um, you know, you're looking to do something with a North Node going through your 12th house of work and service. I also look at your natal Saturn. Saturn's the exalted ruler of your Libra. You're thinking, like, how am I going to do something some type of work or whatever with my life that's a reflection of my values. How am I going to integrate this? Yeah, sure, I could go work at a at a smoothie shop and make smoothies for people and put some money in my pocket, but how am I really going to do what I came here to do, which is, you know, just make a living spreading the damn universal truth. That's what I see going on with you right now. Then come November 2013, uh, this coming November, the North Node is going to transit into Virgo, and it's going to be there till roughly January 2016. That's going to be in your 11th house, peers of the realm. So you're getting things set up where you're going to meet a lot of important people who are going to help maybe you know, give you a little tug and pull you where you need to be. And then, uh, let me get my other chart here. Hold on one second so I got this time right. Give me one second, Russ. Where'd that chart go? Hold on one second. Okay. Um, that North Node will be in Virgo till January 2016, and then from uh, January 2016 till roughly, roughly uh, December 2017, you're going to have the North Node transiting through Leo, hitting your natal South Node in the 10th house. Um, you know, normally when that happens, that's... Um, uh, I'll get, uh, I mean, I have to think about that. That gets a little complex when the North Node meets the South Node. I mean, what that basically is, is uh, you're going to have the South Node in Aquarius meeting your natal North Node in Aquarius. That's sometimes where you're revisiting past life stuff and you're being challenged into moving into your true destiny. But the point being is just, just for now, we'll get to that. You can talk to me when that time comes up. That's not till November 2000, December 2017. I'll figure it out more. But what's going on now, you're just looking for, what am I going to do on a day-to-day -day basis where I can do something, where I'm, I've got some type of work, some type of livelihood that reflects who I am and what I'm about. This, Doing things the conventional way is just not going to work for you. And you're getting set up by November. You're going to have a two-year, roughly a little over two-year streak where you're going to be meeting some, some people who are going to articulate some things to you. And you're going to start to understand, okay, all right, these are the kind of people I need to be connected with, and they might be able to do something for you. Um, another thing, too, that's going on, Russ, uh, Pluto's transiting through your second house of um, second house of finances. And you've got... 
and values. It's going through Sagittarius. It's going to be there roughly. I'm too lazy to figure it out, but Pluto moves very slowly through constellations. It's probably going to be in Sagittarius for another five to seven years, something like that. Wherever Pluto's at, that's where there's a major, major restructuring in that house. So, once again, you know, Pluto going through your second house, particularly when that north node was going through Ophiuchus prior to August 2012, Pluto rules Ophiuchus and Scorpio. So, this being said, you know, you went through a major structure, uh, restructuring of your values. Um, anything that was not serving you was stripped away, and you're still somewhat going through that process. But that's good. What remains is absolutely very strong. Very strong. So, you're going through... This Pluto going through your second house in Sagittarius, you know, might have something to do on a mundane level with money, you know, but on a higher level, it's like you're getting to the real core in essence, you're being forced, like, this is who I really am, I'm embracing it 1,000, 100,000 percent, you're going through some of that now, too, so Russ, that's what I say in your reading, man, that's an hour, is that good, Does that help? Great, man. All right, I'll get this emailed out to you. Listen to this. Uh, you're extremely intelligent. You're already in tune with the stuff. I'm just giving you some of the more nuts and bolts of how this thing works, giving you some type of conceptual framework. But you, with a north node of Aquarius, your brain, you might take this to a far higher level than me. I recommend, you know, trying to reconcile what you see with what you hear on this recording. If you got any questions, man, feel free to call me, shoot me an email, because that's all part of the follow-up, what you pay me for. And like I said, I don't charge for that. I don't, you know what I mean? You pay one time and that's it. You've been more than generous with me. So, I hope this was helpful. Let me stop the recording.